Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly in five minutes. Thank you for, for those of you who are here early. Thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realised before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. So first of all, Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Force Major and Frustration of Contract in Sale and Purchase Agreements and Transactions. My name is Anis Suhaimi. I'm an associate with Marwen Kwai and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. <clears throat> Marwen Kwai and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Ma Wang Kwai. Our ABLE team today comprises 22 lawyers and 19 support staff. Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small, medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with four departments, namely corporate dispute resolution, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our firm also has five practice areas, and these practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk, is part of our, on, our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which have been broadcasted online, live. But with the COVID-19 Movement Control Order, or MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsel. Please visit our website at mawinkrai.com for more information to read our articles and to sign up for upcoming talks. Next, allow me to introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker is one of our partners, Ms. Sarah Kambali, who leads the Real Estate Practice Group, as well as our Sharia Estate Planning Team. Sarah holds a Bachelor of Laws degree 
from the International Islamic University of Malaysia and also holds a postgraduate post diploma in Sharia law and practice from UITM. She was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2007 and her practice areas involve real estate transactions such as drafting, sale and purchase agreements, tenancy agreements, as well as Sharia estate planning which involves drafting and executing wills under Islamic law. Sarah is also a member of the convincing committee of both the Slango Bar and the KL Bar. Our next speaker is Marcus Leong. Marcus is an associate in our real estate department. He graduated from the University of West England with a Bachelor of Laws and has also obtained a Master of Commercial Law from University Malaya since then. Marcus was called to the Malaysian Bar in 2018 and his areas of practice include preparing sale and purchase agreements, loan documentation and transfer of property. We have a Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido or in the chat and we will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave this slide up for a while so you can scan it before we move on. As we are all aware, the MCO was in force beginning 18th March and since then has been extended twice. Today marks the first day of the third phase of the MCO, which will last until 28th April and could possibly be extended again if conditions don't, in, don't improve. Now, we all know that everyone has been affected by the MCO in one way or another, and those involved in the sale and purchase of property are no exception. Since there are strict timelines which must be followed during the process of purchasing and sell, selling property, it begs the question of whether the MCO has an impact on the process and if so, whether it is for the better or for worse. So this is an aspect that we will look into, into today, as well as the following top points. The meaning of force majeure and frustration of contract, parties affected by the current movement order, time is of the essence, will, it be, will time be extended, and application in case laws. With all that said, I now invite our first speaker to begin with what is force majeure? Over to you, Sarah. Hi, good morning everybody. I hope all of you have had your breakfast. Uh, it's the first day of the third, ex uh, basically the third extension, uh, second extension, third phase of MCO, Movement Control Order. And I'm sure most of us are really either tired, bored, uh, having cabin fever. Uh, yeah, I'm even taking up a virtual background so that it feels like office right now. So uh, I am, now uh, going to be giving a talk on the effect of the sale and purchase agreement during MCO. In uh, particular, the two things that we might be looking into, which is uh, force majeure and also the, the doctrine of frustration of contract. All right. Uh, so without further ado, let me just share with you the slide. All right, what is force majeure and what is frustration of contract? As you know, and as our, my colleague has mentioned, MCO, Malaysian Movement Control Order has started 18th of March and is still going on until the end of 28th of April. It's almost a month uh, and it has it resulted a lot of impact. The first time I heard that the government is going to start this MCO process, my first thought wasn't about how I'm going to live, but uh, as a, an avid person who takes care of her clients most of the time, uh, or tries to, I am very, um, how do you say, concerned or scared. I, I would say a lot of emotions went through my mind. What's going to happen? So. The government has given us one day to prepare. So as soon as we got in office before the MCO started, me and my team, we had looked over all the files. I can't imagine the ones with uh, a lot of files from um, just starting to uh, maybe redemption stage, uh, maybe even vacant possession or releasing balance purchase price waiting for developer to get notice of assignment, all those things, uh, stamping at the land office, uh, at the stamping office and presenting registration at the land office, all those are 
the process that will be halted due to the MCO. Uh, so what would happen to all these files? So we had actually moved and uh, all the files and try to segregate which one needs more attention, thinking that MCO will last 14 days. So it didn't last 14 days, as everyone knows. It lasted for at least now it's the third installment. So let's go to force majeure. Force majeure, funnily enough, uh, ironically, is a clause that lawyers will call it boilerplate clauses, whereby it is something that not everybody looked in, look it, look into it really, really uh, deeply because we're thinking, all right, it's force majeure. Most of us, if you're lawyers who are attending this talk, thank you very much, but you will be thinking force majeure, yeah, act of God. That would be the very famous line. For those who are not lawyers or maybe um, just wanting to learn about this, this is what we learn. Force majeure is act of God. Uh, situations where cannot be helped. So what, how, what and how does a force majeure work? So a force majeure, if you look into my, uh, the slide that we've prepared, force majeure event refers to an occurrence or an event or circumstance which is outside the reasonable control of a party and or could not have been foreseen at the time the contract was entered into, which prevents the party from performing its obligation under a contract. Okay. The English common law, which we follow, has no general concept of force majeure, save for the doctrine of frustration. So both we will discuss uh, today. So, so how does a force majeure clause be effective? So an effective force majeure clause contains two main components. One is that the force majeure event. Two is that consequence of the occurrence means that what happens after that force measure happened, all right? So I've taken the liberty to take one, one of uh, our own force measure clauses uh, with a bit of here and there tweaks. So this is basically what it looks like. First, the description of what amounts to a force measure event. In the event that the property or part thereof, remember, it's referring to the property, okay? is prior to the date of the delivery of worker possession damaged or destroyed by fire, lightning, tempest, flood, riot, civil commotions, earthquake, malicious act, strike, or such other causes not due to the fault of the vendor. Fair wear and tear accepted. So this is force majeure events. But if you guys look, if all of you look into your force majeure clauses, anyone who has a sale and purchase agreement right now, or any uh, reference online, Google up, uh, just look into the force majeure clause that you have right now. It specifically mentions about the property. So the being of the property. In Malaysia, there's no possible of earthquake, but if it happens, that's, this is a force, force majeure event. So it must be covered in this clause. But we, in COVID-19 and the MCO situation right now that we're facing, we have no idea that this would be one of the reasons why SMP cannot be, uh, cannot be processed or any kind of contract can be processed. Yeah? Because we never thought that this could happen. We had never had this situation in our minds. Okay? So these are, just keep in mind, this is the force majeure events. And usually, more often than not, your SMP will have the ones that relating to the property. All right. So now, the consequences of the occurrence of a force majeure event. The purchaser shall be entitled to terminate this agreement by notice in writing to the vendor to that effect. And upon such termination, vendor shall immediately refund the purchaser all the monies paid okay within 14 days okay this is the effect okay, you guys can read that yeah so the effect is towards the property that has gone through a force majeure event so the purchaser is entitled has of right to terminate this agreement and usually it says terminate 
Yeah, he doesn't say that time will be stopped until the property is um, reconstructed. If it was a uh, if it was a earthquake, for example, yeah, it didn't say that. It doesn't say that because wait until the strike ends. If it was a strike in front of the property then we proceed with the sale and purchase agreement. It doesn't say that, it says terminate. But again, force majeure clauses varies from each sale and purchase agreement to another sale and purchase agreement for sub-sale matters. Uh, so this force majeure clause could be different. Some other people might have other than terminate other kinds of uh, consequences. Yeah. So when you terminate, it's back to status quo. No one's at fault, not the purchaser, not the vendor. So in this case, since it's back to status quo, all payments made, return back. Return back to the purchaser, all the payments made. All right. Even if it has been paid to RPGT, for example, it's within that 60 days and it's already been paid, then the purchaser has the right to get back the money from the uh, RPGT department. You have to write in, you have to say this is terminated because of force majeure, right? If the vendor themselves cannot return back all this money, then there will be an 8% interest on the money not returned. Okay, other than that, the documents that has been provided to the vendor, um, by the vendor, sorry, by the vendor to the purchaser or the purchaser's financier should be returned back to the vendor. Then everything goes back to status quo. So this is force majeure. And it must be said in the sale and purchase agreement. Okay, It must be there in order to be uh, activated. All right? So it, it is mentioned in RHP Capital Berhad against Harta Bintang, Charta Bintang. Okay, you can have a look at the case. So in this case, it says force majeure clauses are clauses generally intended to include risks beyond the reasonable contract of a party. In essence, it frees both parties from li liability or obligation when an event such as war, riot, or act of God, such as earthquake, takes place. So it says here, war, riot, and or act of God. Yeah, this is the findings in this case. Yeah, one of the one of the methods mentioned in this case. So it must be included all these risks. Okay. Of course, force majeure is not an automatic right. Meaning that just because it's in there, it doesn't mean uh, it can be implemented. You have to request for it, activate it, okay? And a force majeure clause cannot be implied into a contract. So it's not automatic and it cannot be implied, okay? Cannot be implied here means if it's not there in the clause one, two, three, four, five, in all the sale and purchase agreement terms, if it's not there, means you can't get force majeure. Right. Okay. Force merger is only available if the sale and purchase agreement or tenancy agreement has a clause to provide for it. Yeah. So you can only activate it if it's in there. And you have to look at what are the events. You have to look into what are the consequences. So my question, and a lot of you might be asking, would COVID-19 trigger force merger clauses? My answer? my personal answer or by looking at everybody's answer extensively it all depends on the wording of the clause as i've said before it checks on the events that happen yeah the event that happened so in most force majeure clause you have a look back usually it's on properties the effect of the property being damaged or unable un inability to actually go to the property those are the force majeure clauses usually yeah and what happens it doesn't say time is stopped it says termination 
Okay, so if the wording of the clause covers COVID-19, which mostly no, or an MCO situation, anything of a similar, where the maybe it by chance, it says like, if there's any ruling of law or government intervention in stopping uh, property, like right now, most of us uh, lawyers for conveyancing and real estate practices are, are not able to complete their tasks because most of the stakeholders of the real estate uh, transactions, government bodies are not essential service. Even with the third uh, installation here for the MCO, they're not listed. Land office is not listed. I know stamping office is, but there's restriction to lawyers to use stamp office. And even if, let's just say, you can do stamps online for all those lawyers who does have e-stamps, stamps online, yeah? For those who are doing stamps online and baru na educate, just about to do the adjudication for the property, the stakeholders are not working. The valuer, or rather JPPH, Jabatan Penilaian, the government valuer, is not working. They cannot be giving you a notice anytime soon. Yeah? So this doesn't help the situation. It's unable to perform. But is it enough to trigger force majeure? You have to look into the proofs. All right? And the burden of proof will be on the party who is relying on the clause. Okay? It could be the purchaser, it could be the vendor, either one of them. Okay, now, we've looked into what is force majeure. Now, let, allow me to go through the what is frustration of contract. As for those who have questions, uh, there is Slido. You need to go to www.slido.com and key in the number 60023, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, key in the number and put your questions there. It is best that you put your questions there because at the end of the talk, we will address them. We will try to address everyone's questions. For those who put it in the chat, we will try and capture them and put them in Slido, but you would need to make sure that your own questions come into the Slido. Yeah? All right, back to the talk. What is frustration of contract? So the doctrine of frustration of contract is in our Contracts Act 1950, which it says a contract to do an act which after the contract is made becomes impossible. This is frustration, okay? It becomes impossible. Or by reason of some event which the promiser cannot, could not prevent, becomes unlawful. And it becomes void when the act becomes impossible or unlawful. This is in 57, subsection 2, yeah, of the Contracts Act. Two main instances in there for the frustration is impossible to perform, okay, unlawful to perform. And if those are done, then it is frustrated because it becomes void. That's the frustration of contract. In this case, Guan Ai Mo, KL Central Bohat against Slango Properties Berhad. Yeah. The three elements that was mentioned here is the event which frustrated the contract. No provisions has been made in the contract. Okay. They are trying to show the elements of frustration in this case. Okay. So the three elements here is that the event which frustrated the contract, yeah, and uh, not responsibility of for either party, okay, and event which is said to discharge must be radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. Okay, in Guan Aikmo, uh, in Guan Aikmo, it's actually a, a situation where it was a higher purchase situation. This is a court of appeal case and it's a higher purchase situation. The car was compounded or um, taken by the government, right? Just because it was not paid, the levy was not paid, right? So now they are trying to say it's frustration. Without the car means there's no way of transferring the title. So cannot be, uh, cannot proceed cannot pay the loan, right? That's what they're trying to say. The frustration is that there's no car. However, in the contract itself, you have to look. That higher purchase contract, 
did mention that the tax levy needs to be paid. Yeah? So if the tax levy is not paid, it will be confiscated. And if it's confiscated, then the situation is already there. So basically, frustration is where a situation, just like force majeure, a situation that is not in the contract. Force majeure, you mention everything in the contract, you must, you must be there. But frustration is outside the contract. So when it's outside the contract, it's not thought of and it's frustrating the contract. There's no provisions for it. Okay, self-induced frustration is also ineffective in the sense that it's not frustration when you could have remedied it, all right? So in this situation, in one at most case, it was actually something that could have been remedied by paying the levy. The frustration of the car being taken away is the self-induced frustration. Okay, let's just say both of that is not there means that it is all right lah. Uh, it wasn't something that they thought of but it's not radically different this situation this event is not radically different that cannot undertake to perform the contract right the the taking away of the car is not radically different until it becomes frustration in terms of proceeding with the contract my colleague, Marcus Leong, will continue this uh, in his presentation with regards to cases, yeah, application of cases for frustration and force measure. Okay. So another test of frustration in Ramli bin Zakaria against government of Malaysia. This was actually a situation where long time ago, 38 years ago, where there was a contract for teachers, training teachers. They had one contract, they had one training contract to be uh, absorbed, but then some other training contract came about and the other one was stopped. So the test here was about the radically different. The, the previous teachers just do not want to go through the other one because they said that the the pay, the salary uh, scheme is not at par as the original one. But looking into the bigger picture, the second one was done up in a way that it gives more benefits to the teachers that was in training. Okay, it was just a transition that these teachers were not allowed, were, were not uh, happy about at the moment and was not satisfied. Yeah, so it was radically different to them, but it's not. So in this case, uh, the it's it was said by the judge that uh, frustration occurs whenever the law recognizes that without default of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed. In this case, it's still able to be performed. Okay, the salary scheme was still being given because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. Okay, so the teachers were undertaking to teach and the others were undertaking to give the salary. So this is one of the other contracts. All right, so we shall move on. Now that you know the definition and how it works, force measure, and also the doctrine of frustration of contract, we shall proceed with the current situation. How do you apply this in the current MCO? I've given a background check. Have a, whatever questions you have, reflect it back on this matter, on the definition. We always go back to definition in law and legal. We always go back to definition. When everything becomes very complicated, go back to basics. What is the contract? And what is frustration? What is force measure? Right? So without further ado, I am now going to share with you my colleague, Marcus. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, morning, everyone. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, so I'll be elaborating on the parties affected during the MCO. The first one, uh, let's talk about developers. 
So in this article uh, I've pasted on this slide, the developers are actually seeking for extension of time because they are afraid that they could not complete their projects on time. So they are seeking this to prevent the LED or late delivery charges. And actually this COVID-19 and MCO is beyond the developer's control and through no fault of the developers. So is it fair for them to apply for an extension of time? I actually think it's acceptable. Okay, next. So we will look at the purchases side. So during this MCO, it's quite difficult to get VP for purchases and then they are unable to stem agreements the purchases solicitors and land office is also closed at, at during this uh, MCO and they are unable to present the documents in land office so there is actually uh, a need for a COVID-19 temporary measure bill for this uh, all these issues here and of course this period they also cannot attend any signing of uh, the SPA or any other agreements. Similarly for the vendor solicitors, uh, it's difficult to give VP as well due to this uh, restricted movement and it's quite hard to receive the balance purchase price because VP is not given to them and uh, they are unable to uh, attend any signing as well. For tenancy agreements, uh, landlord and tenant. So in this uh, Tenancy agreement, landlord, is, uh, should they, should they co continue to collect their rental or uh, evict the tenant? And the tenant here will usually say uh, it's times are hard, they cannot do their business. So uh, they're unable to pay their rent. So these are the parties affected uh, during the MCO. And then uh, the common question asked is whether time can be extended. So uh, referring to our Bar Council Malaysia circular, this is just a guide. Actually, it says it depends on the contents of the agreement. So in the event there's a force majeure clause that covers uh, government action, parties may not be liable or they can get that extension of time. And if there's no such clause or the clause does not cover uh, COVID-19 or government action of this MCO, totally up to the parties to resolve or negotiate. Okay, so now we look at a few examples in case laws. So in this case of Intan Payong Syndrome Berhad in 2004, it was held that the burden of proof will be on the party who is relying on the clause to be excused from his obligations of the contract. So for example, if one party wants to rely on the clause in the contract, he must prove that it is impossible to carry out his obligations of the contract. And in the case of uh, Muhammad Rahidin, the courts have refused to imply force major clauses into the contract where the contract is silent on the same. So this was mentioned just now by uh, Sarah that force major clauses are not automatic and cannot be implied into a contract. So we look at uh, frustration cases now. So all these cases here are instances of frustration they have uh, something in common, which is they cannot be, it is impossible to perform their part of the contract. So for the first one, the case of Hua Wing Leung, it is the inability of a promiser to obtain license. So in this case, this uh, tenant rented a property to carry out his karaoke business. But then this property is under a housing condition in which they need to convert it into a business, business type of property. But then in this case, they have failed to convert the property and then, so there's an inability to obtain a license. So there is a, it is impossible to carry out the agreement anymore because he cannot carry out his business. So in this standard chartered bank, Kuala Lumpur Landmark Syndrome Bahad, it is a grant of an injunction. So the plaintiff and the defendant they have entered into a redemption agreement. So the D has promised to pay plaintiff a sum, but then one day a third party has entered an injunction to restrain them from completing this redemption agreement. So they cannot carry out what was uh, agreed in that redemption agreement. And so it is frustrated. 
Last one, seizure of compulsory acquisition by the government. Actually, uh, in this case, public finance, uh, uh, what they seize is uh, actually a car. A car hire purchase agreement. So, uh, between the respondent and the appellant. So, this car was seized by uh, the government, the customs. So, in the end, the contract is impossible to perform because the car was not uh, the, the car was seized by the government, so the agreement, higher purchase agreement, cannot uh, take on any further. So it was frustrated. Okay, so we look at cases where there is no frustration. There is no frustration where the act becomes difficult to perform. So in this case of Pacific Forest Industries, Sandran uh the court held that when the task becomes difficult to perform, there is no frustration because it is still possible to be performed. And then in big in industrial gas syndrome, Berhad, where there was a self-induced frustration, in that case, um, the party refused to carry out what was still, um, he has refused to carry out the options available and has tried to say that it's frustration, but then is it actually a self-induced frustration and therefore, Self-induced frustration is no frustration. And in this case, Sento Raya Sandriam Berhad is actually a financial crisis which makes uh, uh, make it more burdensome for the party to pay, to pay all these uh, LAD to purchases. It's a developer uh, which has failed to deliver the properties on time and then uh, they, they need to pay them the purchases uh, some of late delivery charges. So in this case, because there's a financial crisis, it is not enough uh, to amount to frustration. So similarly to our situation right now where tenants have said that uh, they are tied and then uh, they are unable to pay rent, this is actually not enough uh, to amount to uh, frustration financial crisis or uh, financial constraints are not enough for, to amount to frustration. So it is always the best to negotiate with the other party, for example, your landlord, and see whether is there anything you can uh, ask for a extension of time on paying the rent. Okay, lastly, this one is the English case, Davis contractor against Fairham UDC. So in this uh, case, they have, the contractors have promised to finish this uh, construction in eight months. But then due to a shortage of labor and materials, they have took a longer time to complete the construction. And therefore, shortage of labor and materials and in building contracts is not sufficient to frustration because it is only making it more difficult to perform and not impossible to perform. Okay, so uh, I think that's all from me. So we will now uh, move forward to the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, Marcus and Sarah. Um, we've come to the question and answer session. So we can, you can see all the questions on Slido in your screen now. Marcus and Sarah, you can take over which questions you would like to answer. All right, if you don't mind, I can take the first question first. All right, will the time of delivery vacant position to be extended due to this MCO as many construction being delayed? Well, uh, this is a very unprecedented uh, times that we live in. Never had we have a situation where all of the stakeholders for real estate is not working or rather not an essential service so we cannot proceed and provide move forward even the developers are ordered to stop work everyone is stop working and staying at home so there's no hard and fast rule at this moment in other words the situation is that we do not have a, a COVID-19 app uh, for for construction or sale and purchase agreement, uh, all this situation, uh, unlike our neighboring country at the moment. So we are hoping that with a proper act, 
uh, we will be able to answer this question. Uh, other, my, my best way to answer this question is to proceed and also negotiate with your purchases. Because uh, for me, myself, I also have personally, I have one that the developer had sent out the letter uh, to say that they are not able to deliver vacant possession. So in this situation, I think it's best that you send out those emails, you send out those, um, I would say documents that if in the event that this doesn't pan out to a proper negotiation or a successful negotiation, then you would have to have all this documented uh, that you have tried, at least. We do not know what's the, what's the, what's the yardstick. We do not know that it's very unprecedented right now. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. I know it, it doesn't answer fully, but I hope that answers the question. Okay, next so, question. So I'll take on the second question, Sarah. Thank you very much. So can tenant claim a force majeure due to the MCO, even though still residing in a condo under a residential tenancy with a force majeure clause? All right, so uh, since you are still residing in the condo, uh, I don't see what's the reason of claiming a force majeure. Uh, maybe you want to delay your rental. If it is clearly stated in the agreement that you can delay rental due to this MCO, then yes, you can talk to your landlord to ask for an extension of time to pay the rental. Other than that, uh, if it is not covered in the agreement, then it is also the best to negotiate this with your landlord. All right. Okay, for commercial and business tenancy, can tenant claim force measure by suspending payment of service charges due to MCO uh, that has badly affected the tenant's business? It also uh, depends on what was stated in the agreement, the tenancy agreement. So if this was included, then yes, answer is yes. And similarly, if it is not included, then it is best to negotiate with the landlord as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, maybe I can take the next one because it does mention me. So is the force measure clause explained by Ms. Sarah is applicable to current COVID-19 situation where the fact, uh, when the fact is building is not destroyed by act of God, etc. Yes, that is why I emphasized very much on the fact uh, that you have to look into the force majeure clause itself. How does your force majeure clause in your sale and purchase agreement or tenancy agreement or any other contract, how does the force majeure clause look like? What kind of extension of damages of the property or situations or events of that force majeure? you got it right when it says it's not destroyed by act of God. Right now, COVID-19 is not destroying any, any property. So how do we get force majeure clauses out there to be a, a, a situation where we can claim for? So you have to look into it. If you can't have it, means the next way is doctrine of frustration. You can try and look into that. So if you cannot activate force majeure clause because it talks about property, it talks about the, the, the situation event that doesn't show or is not similarly to what is going on right now. You have to look into doctrine of frustration and look into those, those things that we have mentioned earlier. What is doctrine of frustration? What is the elements that must be proven? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, next question I want to take here. Yeah. Hand over VP few days before MCO. Shall the developer charge the purchaser miscellaneous maintenance, sinking fund, and what so not from VP date or charge after MCO? Okay, there is one. Uh, was it Sentul Raya, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yes, that I read just now? Sentul Raya, right? So, in this Sentul Raya case, if you guys look into it again, uh, Basically, they look into the probability of what is the LED amount and how much is the maintenance and sinking fund. If it's able to be uh, set off, then you can uh, set it off and, you know, means that the maintenance and sinking fund continues. Yeah. But uh, having said that, 
I am pretty sure the developers out there also could not deliver the VP. You guys also do not want to have the LED because even though you have that notice, okay, deem, blah, 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 but there are cases whereby they take the LED up to the day the actual vacant possession. There are cases. So it really depends on how the court will rule and how strong your case is. Of course, with COVID-19, I think amicably both parties should look into each other. We are not in this alone. All of us is at home. All of us are staying at home, un unless you're a frontliner. And all of us is suffering. So please, be kinder and both parties, either your developer or the purchaser, think of that. Think of, okay, the developer do not want LED and I do not want sinking fund and service charge to be paid because of this COVID-19. Find a middle ground, okay? All right. Next, Amakas, maybe? Okay, uh, if the SP, okay. uh, how about payment paid to property agent? Okay, so this payment paid to property agent, I think if, if the agent is helping you to uh, look for a house or maybe sell your house, uh, the agent could still, I think, could still carry out his, uh, his, or her's his or her duties during this MCO by looking for a buyer or maybe um, getting a, the house for you. So I think uh, highly likely it's not refundable, the payment paid to the property agent. Or if all this cannot be done right now, the property agent should carry out after the MCO is lifted. Thank you, Marcus. I think we have time for two more questions. Thank you, Anis. And I see there's about like 20 over questions. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of questions in here. Uh, I'm very grateful that you guys have all the questions here. I will try and have a look into it. Um, Okay, uh, there's one question that I saw down there, uh, whether the standard schedule H does not seem to contain both force measure nor frustration clause. Is this correct? How shall we go about it then for reference? Okay, um, schedule, you're right, schedule G and schedule H does not mention about force majeure because it's a statutory sale and purchase agreement. Don't call it standard, it's not standard, it's statutory sale and purchase agreements. So because of this, it doesn't even fall under the Contracts Act. So uh, it's not going through the force majeure or the frustration clauses. However, um, for this to be uh, like the developers, for instance, most of you are doing res residential uh, sale and purchase agreement, which will be under HDA, which Schedule G and Schedule H. My, my best bet is that you negotiate. The key term right now that I would like to put out there is that we have a lot of negotiation to do after this MCO. Whether it's the lawyers to be um, the negotiator for the clients or the developer themselves or the purchaser and vendors to negotiate among themselves. After this MCO, we are going to go through a lot of changes, uh, a lot of effects uh, for MCO. So the Schedule G and Schedule H, no matter what, it does not fall under the Contracts Act because it's a contract on its own. It has its specific clauses and it doesn't have force measure. So my best bet, negotiation. You guys have to negotiate how to go about it. Yeah, I even have just for uh, information, I have, I have cases where uh, possibility of um, the deadline for POS, for those who do not know POS, the Proclamation of Sale, Yes, proclamation of sale is those that are an auction cases by court or, you know, uh, by land office. So these POS are due in May. What do you do? It's a very uncharted territory. So my best bet is you speak to the bank uh, that actually did the lelong, did the auction and uh, try to negotiate with them, do a private treaty because time cannot be extended. And in the National uh, Land Code, time can't be extended for Russian cases. Yeah, all right. So Marcus, your turn. Maybe you take one question. All right, I'll take the first one. Uh, is the force majeure can only be applied to MCO periods or can 
the tendon extend to the periods before and after the MCO starting February 20th. Okay, actually the force measure can be applied uh, throughout the agreement, the, the, the duration of the agreement. So uh, not just MCO periods, it can be applied to maybe war or maybe uh, acts of God, earthquake, flood and things like that. So um, can it be extended to the periods before and after the MCO? It depends uh, uh, what is worded in the force major clause. Uh, standard answer, what is worded in the force major clause. And yeah, it depends what, what type of reasoning you want to use as well uh, to extend or I mean to use the force major clause if it's after the MCO. Because uh, starting February 20th, it, mean, it means the MCO hasn't been uh, started. So depends on the reason uh, you want to use and whether the force major clause uh, has covered that reason. If yes, then yeah, you can use your force major clause. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Okay. Anis, do we have a time to take another question? Um, I think you can have one more. We'll, we'll take the last question. Okay, Marcus, I'm giving it to you because if it was me, I'll take it for a longer period. So I leave it to you to take another question. Okay, we look at the first one. Uh, if the SPA is signed by both parties and the vendor is working on handover as part of condition precedent, can either part claim force major? Okay, so uh, in this situation, uh, the party who wants to claim force major, we have the burden to prove that they are uh, the task is impossible to, I mean, the task is, cannot be carried out during this uh, period. So if they're working on the condition precedent and if the force major clause covers uh, this condition precedent handing over, yeah, you can actually use this clause um, to maybe extend the time and or uh, to do it after the MCO is lifted. So yes, if the clause has covered this, Handing over condition precedent, yes, you can use this clause. Okay. Thank All you. right. Um, thank you, Sarah and Marcus, for your insights. Be, uh, before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, sorry, Anis, can I add something? Yeah, sure. Okay, so for those uh, questions which uh, we are unable to answer, you can always drop us an inquiry in our website. So we can answer you through email or we can WhatsApp you your uh our answers to your question. Okay, thank you, Anis. All right. So first of all, um, please join us again for our upcoming talks. Um, this Friday, we have one uh, lined up this Friday. Our associates, Jasmine Wong and Eric To, will be speaking on citizenship for adopted children and stateless individuals. Um, then next week, Gan and Priscilla will start the week off with wills and administration of estates. And we also have a... Um, we also have an online talk under SIPA and Christine, uh, our associates Christine and Hannah will be covering um, whether a successful claimant can issue a statutory demand under section 46, 466 of the Companies Act, uh, Companies Act 2016 against a moving party based on an adjudication decision. Um, secondly, um, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form has been posted in the chat and you can also scan the co code from this slide. We do, we appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our services for you in the future. So I'll leave this up for a few, for a while for you to scan. Please also follow or, or like our social media accounts. And as, Ma as Marcus mentioned earlier, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30 minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Um, you can fill in the form in our website and the link is also posted in the chat box as well as you can also scan the code um, you see before you now. To our guests, um, finally, thank you. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank, thank you everyone. everyone. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Stay home, stay safe, and we hope to see you at our next talks.